Hi folks, Florida Man here, and today I'm bringing you an after action report on a PDT Super Pastis 21 game. This time it's game 1C. Hello, Priggle. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to be meeting you as well, and I'll share the screen so that we can uh, both look at the map for your game you were in. Thank you for being willing to share your recollections on Super Pastis game 1C for 20. Had to help. Glad to help however I can. First of all, for the audience, which country were you? Um, I was playing as Turkey. Okay. I've already spoken to a couple of uh, the Western powers, so it'll be interesting to have a perspective from the opposite side of the map. What exactly were you uh, thinking and, and communicating with other players in the early game? Um, in the very early game, of course, the first year I was communicating with everybody. Um, I, I should start by saying I, I really enjoy playing Turkey. Um, I like the way it develops and it's slow out of the box and can be a little bit more cautious than some of the other countries. It gives you more time to communicate. Um, at the same time, when I started this game, I was feeling pretty intimidated and cautious because um, I'm fairly new to the game of diplomacy. And in my head, I was like, ah, oh, it's a tournament and everyone else must be terrific. So I'm just going to take my time and, and see what happens. So I think in the first few turns, I was trying too hard to... Um, be nice to everybody even more so than usual like I was really hoping everybody would be my friend really truly and it made it hard for me to be decisive in the early game I see you um you did indeed not you, you didn't open to Armenia so already that's uh you know relatively nice to Russia and at the same time you also did not move Smyrna to Constantinople mm -hmm. so being sort of uh less aggressive toward Austria I see what you mean by trying to be everybody's friend right do you know what was up with that Russian fleet in Armenia? Um, if I'm remembering correctly, because I had two games that started exactly this way. And um, yeah, so this game, um, Russia and I had spoken, he didn't want to bounce in the Black Sea. And again, I was being friendly with everybody and saying, okay, well, let's try it. But I also moved to Smyrna instead of Constantinople because I didn't, I wanted to have something there to protect myself if Russia decided to try to ease into Turkey. That is, that is interesting. Uh, hmm. As an alternative to bouncing in the Black Sea, Russia moves to Armenia. Mm -hmm. that, that is so unorthodox, and I, I don't know how I feel about it, because on the one hand, that Russian fleet there can frequently end up being useless for a lot of the game, so maybe this is an opportunity to destroy it. On the other hand, it's a fleet that almost seems to be advancing toward Turkey, and... Uh, doesn't add anything to the momentum that the Russian and Turkish players have, if Russia, especially if Turkey has to use two units to destroy it. Mm -hmm. But um, what, what were your communications with Austria like? Um, at that point, they were generally friendly. Um, I remember hoping earlier, early in the game that he wouldn't move to Albania so that I could jump into Greece. Um, of course, that is exactly not what happened. Um, so from the big, in the very beginning, um, I was friendly to Austria, but I knew that we were going to um, probably come at each other pretty quickly. How unfortunate. Going to the fall, I see you did indeed destroy that Russian fleet. Was that by agreement with Russia or? Yes. Yeah, that was by agreement with Russia. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, probably will promote a better allocation of forces now. Mm -hmm. it's, a good, it's a good idea maybe for a juggernaut alliance to do that. Right. It does announce to the entire board that Russia and Turkey are, are allied, at least in the beginning. But yeah. I was still trying to play it off in my communications as, oh, no, I couldn't believe he moved to Armenia. So, of course, I stamped him out. And I doubt anybody believed that. I, I also doubt that, but it is <laughs> sort of something that could be true. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's um, much more plausible than if you let Russia into Black Sea or Russia let you into Black Sea, and then you were just, you know, playing nicely together from there. Right. So, elsewhere, I see Russia just takes Romania. It's, you know, difficult to do much more given that Russia doesn't even have a fourth unit now. <laughs> And Austria supports supports themselves into Greece. Yep. So pretty standard openings in the East, other than your uh, unusual decisions with Russia that lead to the destruction of that fleet. Mm -hmm. And Italy is looking like uh, he could be eyeing my shores at some point. Yeah, with that convoy, it's 
possibly mm-hmm. setting up Lepanto. So what, what, what are your foreign policy moves at this time? Let's see. At this point, um, I was still communicating with everybody. I was um, uh, very much disavowing any solid alliance with Russia. Mm-hmm. I was uh, thinking about Italy. Let me see. At that point, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, France and I were having really good communications. Um, and, um, yeah, again, it was early in the game. I was, uh, hoping that, um, Austria wouldn't attack me, but as long as Austria didn't attack me, I felt like the game was still early enough that, you know, with some early builds and some development, I still had time to come out of the box later. (laughs) Interesting. Well, I, I think, uh, Turkey is one of those countries that has the benefit that you can afford to actually be patient and grow a little more slowly. Mm-hmm. I think if Austria doesn't get to uh, ideally five centers within 1901, Austria is probably sunk. Right. Or, or, or prevent Russia from getting Romania, something along those lines. Mm-hmm. So Turkey has a little bit more wiggle room as far as uh, ability to safely expand at a more moderate pace. Go into the build phase. I see you get a fleet because yep. you're worried about that Lepanto. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's, you know, probably wise. Austria is bulking up on armies. Russia builds a Moscow army and a northern fleet. I don't know if you had any dialogue with Russia about, about builds. Um, no, Russia every once in a while would tell me what he thought I should build, but um, was not really asking me for ideas about what he should do until a little bit later in the game. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I try to always, uh, well, I try to frequently uh, ask my allies what they think I should do because it's a good way of sounding them out on mm-hmm. a number of things. Early in the game, it's good for gauging their skill level at tactical thinking and also how committed they are to the alliance and then later on as i already know what their skill level is it's very good at gauging both their commitment level to the alliance at that time because they might give me suboptimal orders if Mm -hmm. they are trying to undermine me in some way and if they do that then maybe i can expect a backstab um but makes sense that you're uh you know that you're not giving a lot of input to Russia at this point. I, I would have just expected a second army from Russia and maybe pulling that Baltic Sea fleet back towards St. Pete, unless Russia's expecting support against either Germany or England. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Going to the spring, what were your, yep. what were your maneuverings going on here? Um, so I wanted to start bringing my fleet out a little bit, um, you know, partly to get it engaged and also to, to open up so I could build again if I had the opportunity. Um, I was wary of Austria, and as you can see, Austria did uh, try to go to, to Bulgaria. So I'm glad I supported that with my fleet. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's it, it turned out the way I thought it would. Um, at that point, I was uh, chatting in a very friendly way with France. And um, kind of annoyed by Austria and feeling too weak to do anything about it at that moment. Yeah, it's uh, it is a little bit annoying to be in the situation you're in, where you lack any real forward motion, forward moving power mm-hmm. on your on your front lines, and you have uh, you're going to have some trouble getting it there without that army in Armenia being able to somehow get a beachhead somewhere in Greece or Serbia. May I ask why you kept Armenia there? Were you not trusting Russia or? Um, I can't remember how I was feeling at that point, but I must have just not been trusting Russia. Makes sense. And that, that also explains part of why maybe you supported Bulgaria because Austria was clearly expecting Romania to support Austria into, uh, into Bulgaria this season because Austria didn't use Greece for support as far as I can tell. Right. Did France tell you that they were going to go after Italy here? I think that by that time, yes. I think, I think France was saying, hey, I'm going to um, come over towards the Tyrrhenian. If it wasn't by now, it would have been just a season or two later. Hmm. Because at one point, uh, very soon after this, you'll see France and I were talking a lot about what to do about Italy and cooperating with each other. Well, it makes uh, a lot of sense for, for uh, you to be talking about how Italy might be divided. 
And it seems like Austria is going after Italy too. So Italy's days are, are really numbered here. They really are. Mm-hmm. Italy should not have poked Austria so much in 1901. <laughs> <laughs> well, going to the fall, we see Austria does get into Venice mm-hmm. and you take the Ionian with Austrian support. Yep. What's going on here? This, this okay. shift in the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this started some pretty good shifts in the game. Um, so uh, even though we've moved to this stage pretty quickly, this it, it took us several days to get here. And by here, I was chomping at the bit. I mean, every turn, including retreats and builds, was taking the full 24 hours. And I remember saying to France, this feels like it's, it hasn't even started yet. It feels like we've been doing this forever, you know. <laughs> um Russia at that point had had some good conversations with Austria. Mm-hmm. And I believe by this point was saying to me, hey, look, we're going we're gonna to stab Austria later. Ha ha. But for now, let's the three of us work together and see if we can wipe out the competition. And uh, starting now and for several seasons moving on, I was saying, okay, I'll do it. Hey, Russia, are you ready to stab Austria yet? <laughs> and that, that went on for a few seasons. But this is where we started uh, talking about Austria being another ally. Interesting. Well, I, I guess uh, I guess with the Western Triple, it especially makes sense to uh, try and band closely together and avoid having too much internal strife in the East. Right. Yeah, and, and we talked a lot about the Western the Western Triple and trying to keep it in check. I guess I'm not really surprised that you um, you and Russia were saying though that you're going to stab Austria later. It's just that's the most logical thing for Russia to be saying to you. Uh, wh- whether or not that was actually Russia's intent, hard to say, but um, it certainly uh, certainly doesn't hurt you to get some units around Austria and finally maybe have a shot at some centers. So um, here in the build phase, you, um, you, you don't have any builds, cause you, but, but you've got your stuff positioned to launch at least toward the enemies now. You've got a fleet in Khan and an army in Smyrna. Um, Austria and uh, Russia, I guess, are going to be the land force of this alliance, and you're going to be the Navy. Right. Going to spring. Yes. What happened here? Okay. This is where, for me, it got interesting, because I had still been very friendly with France. Um, even though Russia and I were you know, definitely allies, we're going to be allies through the game, I felt committed to it. Um, Russia, at that point, had asked me to um, treat Austria as an ally temporarily, and I was still having this great conversation with France, right? And France had actually um, agreed to support me into Naples um, in exchange for me supporting France into Rome the following season. I was totally down with it. I was writing back to Russia and Austria saying, hey, look, here's what's going to happen. By the way, um, I want to go ahead and support France into Rome in the next move because, you know, we have time to um, come back from that later. Um, For now, it'll increase France's trust in me. And honestly, I kind of like the guy and I don't want to stab anybody until it really comes down to it because I'm a very codependent player. If I, if I ally with somebody, it just drives me crazy to stab them, which is one of the reasons that I am not a great solo winner, but uh, very happy to draw. So at that point, I was feeling like, like I liked France a lot and didn't want to hurt France's feelings. So you'll see what happens next. Interesting. Uh, I like that little cliffhanger there. Oh, I, I see that instead of supporting France and you support Austria into Rome. Yes, and I felt terrible about it, but it was the right thing to do from a game perspective. Because both Russia and Austria, when I said, hey, I'm going to support France into Rome, they were like, why? In, on what planet would that be a good idea? Here are all the reasons why that's a bad idea. Do this. And I thought about it, and they were right. So um, not only was I sure that they were right, but also I thought, you know what, if I stand up to them now and I just go ahead and support France into Rome, they're going to turn on me and I will be toast. So I went with the allies and betrayed my friend. Well, that's and I think I'm actually blushing, if you can see this on camera, because I still feel very bad about it. <laughs> I, I do think I noticed that, yeah, a little bit of redness. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is interesting. I mean, I, I will say that I am... Uh, did you guys ever consider uh, moving Naples to Rome and Ionian into Naples? Because... I think that might have advanced your position a little more to have fleets on the front lines with France, because then you'd have a better shot at forcing Tyrrhenian Sea. Oh, interesting. Um, We were talking about how to get fleets there, but that particular set of moves never came up. And another interesting thing that happened here was um, Italy had been holding for a few months 
terms, a few terms before this. And so there was a little discussion of, well, has his lead checked out? Has he stopped playing? What should we do? So we did not see the move coming. Uh, the, when uh, I think it was Germany supported Italy into... Trius. Yeah. And, um, and France supported Italy into Venice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there were two sudden things that we did not see coming. It was a good combo. Um, yeah. Yeah. So both, uh, both Italy and I were snakes on this season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it was... It's interesting seeing the battle taking place in the Mediterranean. I feel like that's in terms of um, the battle between the Western Triple and the Eastern, uh, I've been calling it a rat, Russia, Austria, Turkey, uh, the Eastern Rat Alliance. Um, it's interesting that that's the war that's, that that's the section of the war in the Mediterranean that's really developed the most quickly and experienced the most dramatic shifts back and forth at this point. Mm-hmm. Because s- despite the fact that Germany and England are working together in the north. Very little really has happened there. They haven't even gotten to St. Pete at this point. Right. Yeah, and this is only fall 1903. I mean, um, as I said, you know, up to this point, I think this was, what, two weeks into the game? So it took us two weeks to get here. And, you know, I had been feeling so impatient with it until now. And now suddenly with things happening on the board, um, even though the turns were still taking 24 hours at a shot, it, it, to me it felt like things were the tempo had really picked up. Yeah. Feels yeah. like that to me as well. Okay, and I see that, you know, this uh, capture of these two centers, thanks to the Western powers, keeps Italy alive at uh, the same two units that Italy had before. You gain a new uh, fleet, and of course I'm guessing that's tied into this idea that, you know, you're going to be the, na- the navy of the alliance while Russia and Austria will try and field an army that's sufficient to fight off Germany and uh, any other land forces that happen to trickle over. And I imagine if you had decided to build armies here, it probably would have been threatening to your allies. Exactly, yes. Yeah, at some point here, I was asking uh, to be nice. You know, would you guys rather I built an army or a fleet? And it was always fleet, fleet, fleet. You should build a fleet. Yes, naturally, I'm not not surprised. And uh, that is very nice of you to ask. I mean... I personally would also have been building fleets here because I think it's, mm-hmm. it's necessary to try and over, overwhelm the number of French fleets or at least match it. And France also build a fleet in this season, although I think France made a mistake in building it in Brest instead of Marseille. But um, given that France already had three fleets on the scene, plus uh, the Italian fleet potentially at their disposal in Trieste, I think it was probably the right, the right call. Going to the spring, I see a Turkish move into Serbia. And there's this idea that naturally pops into one's head. Is this a stab? Mm -hmm. Is this uh, treachery? Or is it just arranged? Um, It was arranged. Uh, At that point, I was going to zip through Serbia on my way to Trieste. I I figured it was arranged. But Mm -hmm. here's, here's a question that I'm really actually curious about. Did you consider actually just making the stab good because you could have snagged Serbia, Greece, and um, maybe even Romania if you wanted to. And you yeah. have, uh, taken basically taken Austria out of the game and reduced Russia to three centers and made yourself probably the fourth partner in a four-person draw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought about it, um, especially because at that point I was still saying to Russia every so often, it's like, so is this the season? This would be the perfect time. And Russia was saying, no, 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 let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. And that would go on for a couple of years until I came around and said, okay, Austria has been cool. Let's move forward with Austria. I'm not going to fight you on this anymore. Um, but yeah, at the time I was like, ah, oh, this would be, this would be perfect, man. It would be devastating. It would, but I wasn't going to move against Russia. So uh, Russia talked me out of uh, being a stabbing, horrible person or a good player, however you want to see it. And uh, yeah, so I, I went with it. Also, I was still thinking to myself, okay, Russia clearly knows what he or she is doing, Austria the same. Um, they're coming up with these great plans, and if I go with it, maybe I'll learn something. So, You know, hearing your behind-the-scenes thoughts is interesting. Mm-hmm. I will say, though, that like seeing your moves play out when mm-hmm. I was reviewing the game before, um, I... I couldn't tell that you were uh, maybe maybe less experienced or haven't played as, as long. Uh, it seemed to me as if you were uh, playing very skillfully. Yeah. And t- 
taking advantage of whatever opportunities presented themselves. And that the only reason why you maybe didn't do even better is because the Western Triple was very effective at this point. It was. Yeah, it was, was going to take away any opportunity to expand other than maybe going through your neighbors slash allies. Right. Uh, any other thoughts you want to share about this season? Uh, not at this point, no. Okay. Uh, I do see you uh, moved into Ionian. Uh, what, was, uh, what was the thought process there? Um, so again, my fleets were heading westward. Let's see. I know Austria had some plan that they were going to do with that particular fleet. So it wasn't, um, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that was all it was. But yeah. yeah, I see Austria retreated to Greece and then used it to support Ionian to hold uh, or to support Aegean into Ionian. And Ionian mm -hmm. moved into Turanian. So yes. Austria really wanted to keep their fleet back in Greece where they could maybe defend against your possible stabs. Possibly that's it. Austria gives you Trieste, I see. Uh, was that something that Austria was just happy to do? Was it generously offered? Did you force the issue? <laughs> no, it was generously offered, and I took it. Um, it was The idea was to get my army up there um, to be able to support the other armies as they pressed westward. Makes sense to me. And I do feel as if Austria is... Um, very worried about the possibility of that unit being behind their lines rather than in the front line. So it, it was probably a very wise decision on Austria's part to let you have Trieste for now and put that unit closer to where it's part of the, uh, part of the front lines and where you'd maybe be more reluctant to turn away and stab them. Mm -hmm. It didn't even cross my mind at the time, but I bet you're right. Well, it's a, uh, it's, it's good strategy, you know? I, I think um, I'm not surprised it didn't cross your mind because you might have just thought, it's oh, this is a good move against the, the triple, which it also is. But uh, in my head, it's serving two purposes. <laughs> yeah. um, so at this point, you build another fleet, not surprising. And what's the, what's the dialogue looking like? Are you... And uh, how are you in Austria and Russia feeling about the game at this point? Now that Russia um, is all St. Pete and... Uh, mm -hmm. I think at this point, um, so Russia doesn't have a lot of centers, obviously, at this point, um, but was still doing a lot of directing of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had the great plans, knew what the three of us should be doing to work together. The other dynamic that was happening was um, Russia and Austria were having, you know, conversations and, and there were frequent messages between the two of them. And then I would log on, you know, periodically throughout the day and, you know, have to read through the messages and catch up and make sure that they knew I'd been paying attention and hadn't abandoned them. Um, so they were doing a lot more talking than I was. And when I was talking, I was saying things like, okay, I've read what you have to say. That makes sense. Here's what I propose to do. And they would either say, okay, that's great. Or sometimes they refine it a little bit. Um, at one of these steps, I can't remember if it was now or a little bit later. Um, I did make some suggestion that had to do with Italy and they both said, oh, that's great. Let's do that. And <clears throat> that was like a confidence booster for me. I was like, huh. I've got these smart people to say that what I just suggested was good. So that was a good feeling. Well, that's great. Yes. I mean, I, I think you, um, I'm not surprised they're listening to you. You've been playing very competently, but um, I, I'm glad that you're, you know, you're feeling good about this alliance. And I, I feel like the consensus that I've gotten from talking to people who played as the Western powers is that the Eastern powers alliance was very effective and strong and, did a very good job of slowing them down. The Western Triple, when it's operating efficiently, firing on all cylinders, mm -hmm. we should already have taken Warsaw or Moscow or both by now, and it should just be Turkey and Austria fighting each other and trying to hold out against the German and French units that are encroaching. But mm -hmm. that's not what we're seeing here. Right. So that yeah, is and Russia did, a, Russia did a terrific job of holding us together as a team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a tribute to the three of you. you. You all did a good job. Um, here I see you uh, occupy Tunis uh, just mainly because France was focused on retaking the Tyrrhenian Sea. And um, you also move through Romania, which at this point I'm sure everyone knows <laughs> is not a center you plan to keep. <laughs> right. you're, you're on your way to the front line. I was on my way to the front. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, anything you want to share about this season? Um, I think, was this 1906? Is that right? I believe you are probably correct, yes. 1905, 1906. Around this point, I started to get nervous because um, I happened to check the, the status bar. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I think this is the season. Let me count how many centers Germany has. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think by some weird quirk of fate, it was either this season or very close to it. Turkey was actually in the lead by one center. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, everyone's going to kill me. <laughs> yeah. um, so I recognized it as part of a grander plan by Germany and Austria that we were going to move forward. But at the same time, I was like, okay, you guys, let's be equitable about this. You know, and, and I, was, I was being very obsequious. I was like, okay, look, I realize that I'm where I am because of the teamwork here. And I just want you to know I'm not in this to solo. If, if you would like to redistribute centers at any point so you guys can build armies, please feel free. Just let me know. You know, I was really like feeling totally undeserving of, of being in such a good position. So really humble. <laughs> I, I guess my goal for myself as I listen to myself is a year from now when you're interviewing me, I'm going to be cutthroat and ruthless and not this nice. Well, but it was a fun game. Fun. <laughs> Before and after interview where you talk about a game that you're playing in the next Super Pastus and then we can go over how your thought processes compare to this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This one I just couldn't believe I was playing with all these good people. You know? <laughs> I understand, yeah. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed by the talent that I'm surrounded with. Uh, sometimes very much to my detriment, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you, you know, you vacate Romania, and this is where you are at uh, seven, as you pointed out. You have Trieste, Naples, Tunis, Bulgaria, and your home centers, so you are the strongest power. How does it feel? Um... If I bragged my mother. I told my mother. I, I PM'd her, and I was like, hey, so I'm playing this tournament, and I'm in the league. You know, but then I had to explain to her that it was only a fluke of, of the way the game was going. Um, but, yeah, it felt really good, and um, I started feeling more confident. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see what else was going on here. No, it felt good. I mean, at this point, we were, I was definitely sold with Russia. Russia had reached out and said, so are you cool with Austria? And I was like, yes, this is working. Let's do it. Yeah. And I know there was some conversation with England going on, I think with Russia, where um, England was kind of saying, hey, you know, Turkey's getting kind of strong. And Russia was like, oh, yeah, I think Turkey might be going for it. You know, so they were definitely using my number of centers as like a bargaining chip with some of the other countries. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, and it, it is very, it is kind of funny to think about because even though they're using it as like a, a straw threat kind of thing, you are absolutely powerful enough at this point to make a play for the board top. Um, you could you could easily snag three centers from off of uh, Tur Austri Austria and Russia, and mm -hmm. make yourself a ten center superpower, and then you would become the power to beat. Because I mean, it would also cause Russia and Austria to collapse, though. So you have yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So here you you know you build another another fleet mm -hmm. at this point i will say i'm not sure it was not necessarily actually necessary anymore to have more but any armies would probably make you threatening to your allies yeah yeah fleets everywhere yeah boats on top of boats yep it's mm -hmm. not, a, not a bad place to be in any right. case so what was the plan going into uh, into this season? You think? I mean, I, I can um, see you're you're probably about to lose Tunis. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we knew we were going to lose Tunis, and I really didn't care. Um, I think at that point, yeah. I mean, as you said, I had so many fleets. If I lost Tunis, it wasn't going to be any big deal. Um, also, if if it was this one, there was there was one point in the game where I was like, well, if I lose Tunis, I can just build another fleet back in Smyrna. I mean, it was really crazy, the number of fleets that were happening here. So um, wasn't that upset, wasn't even bothering really to protect Tunis. Um, I was just supporting my allies. And um, yeah, at this point, it was, it was uh, very, very well coordinated. And we were all working together to make sure that we were pushing, pushing, pushing. Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. And it's been very well coordinated, I would say, for the last couple of years, really. That's, that's the secret to this game going the way it does, I think, because you know, even though here you do lose Tunis, mm -hmm. fundamentally, beyond this point, the lines are not going to change very much. Right. And um, when does the conversation 
when and how does the conversation start to shift toward making it a six power draw? That was, that was an interesting one. Um, so Russia and Austria were in conversations with the other powers mm -hmm. and they were trying to break up the, the alliance. They were trying to get one person to flip. Um, and it was interesting because it seems to me that, you know, the Western triangle was, was, was pretty tight. Mm -hmm. um, but they were trying to talk England, for example, of course, to turn on Germany and so on and so forth. And at one point there was discussion of, okay, so if we can do that, we could, we could promise a four person draw. Like, eh, well, okay, let's try it. Um, when the talk of the six person draw came up, honestly, I did not expect that to go through. I thought, yeah, because at the time it was being discussed like, okay, well, let's offer it and find out who the ambitious person is. And the next thing I knew, all six people had accepted the draw. Yeah, that's kind of amazing, isn't it? I mean, I think it, it helps that this is a time-limited game. Mm -hmm. You guys had two years left. There was uh, no, no one was going to get to 13, 14 centers, let alone a solo. Right. I mean, I think somebody maybe could have stabbed or for board top because the way things stand, there's not only a six-way draw, but there's like a three or four or five-way tie for most centers because you have six, mm -hmm. France has six, Austria mm -hmm. has six, yeah. Germany has six, Germany. Yeah. <laughs> um, so everyone has six centers except for Russia, mm -hmm. which, you know, is quite natural given that Russia was the one to take the brunt of the initial attack from the Western triple and St. Petersburg is on the other side of the stalemate line. So it's usually going to fall to a concerted Western attack in any case, but um, it is kind of interesting. The alliances were so tight in this game and the players so committed to them that England who could have, you know, walked into Denmark or Portugal or both uh, or Brest, you know, England and Germany could have done a really quick and dirty, easy stab of France and yeah. in the board top position for, for themselves. It would have been a, a, they would have tied for top if they just took one dot each, Paris and Brest, and France was completely helpless to stop them. You know, you had obviously some very good opportunities to stab Austria at this point as well, or Russia or both. And you and England, really, are the players whose restraint, and, and Germany to a lesser extent, are the players whose restraint uh, causes this to be such an evenly matched draw. Yeah, if I had known that everyone was going to accept the draw, I, mm, yeah, I, I, I think I would have held out. Because, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always happy when, when I get to be in a draw. I'm, I'm happy my allies made it to the end. And at the same time, it's like, ah, oh, six-person draw. Mm. I think we could have caused a little more damage by the end of this. Yeah, likewise, I kind of feel as if, um, as if maybe there could have been some some stabbing done, um, mm -hmm. some extra bonus centers gained by some of the powers. I mean, I don't think that there was going to be any ground gained by either the central triple or the eastern triple, if the game continued the way it was. I don't think it's even possible to gain any more ground for either side, really, because we are getting to a place in this game where the players are actually in the stalemate line positions, and so nothing can be changed except for somebody stabbing. But it is surprising and kind of curious and interesting that that stabbing did not happen here, that the game just resolves itself right? Uh, kind of as happily as it can for all concerned. Except without... for Italy. <laughs> well, uh... Yeah, Italy, Italy went off to play a different game now. <laughs> Italy's yeah. happy in the afterlife. So. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for sharing your thoughts on this game. Do you have any other insights you'd like to share with the audience before we uh, close this? Um, I would say just what I learned in this game and what I've learned in this interview is that if you don't admit that you don't feel confident, no one will know. So just, you know, go into the game, put your game face on, uh, pretend you feel as confident as the person you think is the most confident player and uh, see how far you can go. It might help if you're, uh, if you're playing a country in a game to think of yourself as a ruler. Yes. <laughs> you know, think of yourself as being, yes, I am the queen of England. Yes. I, I'm the sultan. Um, you, I have received your emissary, and here is my message back. <laughs> you know, of course, you don't have to write messages like yeah. that, although some people like to. But <laughs> Sometimes I do. 
<laughs> yeah, me too. But uh, sometimes thinking of yourself as someone who is that powerful is a good and needed confidence booster. Mm -hmm. I tend to think of myself too often as the mid-level bureaucrat who's the one stuck delivering the message. So you're right. I should stand up for myself. Yes, I, I am the assistant undersecretary for... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, I like I like the I, I like the idea of the outlook where you're uh, the person who sets policy as well mm -hmm. as delivering the messages. Very nice. Well, thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you for doing this after action report video. I hope you had a good time. I did. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this diplomacy commentary after action report. And if you liked it, you know what to do. Like and subscribe and check out my blog and my Patreon or Ko-Fi. I should note, the people whose names now appear on screen are those without whom this channel and its growth, as it currently exists, might not be possible. So they have my thanks. And until next time, Florida Man, out.